We're going through the book of Revelation, um, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. One of the things I've learned from a lot of the new people in the hallway, yeah, when I, I, I tend to ask this question, I, I say, have you ever studied this book um, before? And usually I hear, uh, nope, okay. And, um, and I say, well, why not? They say, well, the book of Revelation is, is scary, okay. It's scary, it's frightening. So I, I, you know, people don't, and they don't usually say, I try to avoid it, but that's what they're, that's what they're saying, you know. Um, and so anyways, Look, I get it. Um, I was born in 1982, okay? And that means that I am a millennial, okay? Or I'm a very young Xer, just depending on what author you talk to. I personally identify as a millennial uh, just because I believe I'm too optimistic to be an Xer, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, you know Xers because they listen to Nirvana. You know Millennials because they listen to Third Eye Blind. Okay. Some of you, I, I just lost almost everybody. Okay. <laughs> With that being said, being a child of the 80s, okay, my grandpa pastored here, my dad pastored here. I swore I would never pastor here. Andrew and I have been pastoring now for 15 years. Okay, having fun. All right. Just, I'm trying to give you context. I'm not just trying to get applause, but I do like it when you applaud for me. Um, <laughs> Feed me, pray. I'm just kidding. So uh, I remember being a child here. It, uh, the, in the summers, my dad would try to come up with ways to get people to come to church. And we'd do like hamburger night and different things. Um, uh, he would sometimes in the summertime, we'd do movie nights. So movie night here at the church on Sunday nights. And we had a, a film projector, actually a, a projector that would take these films. Like, like do you remember this? Like film? <laughs> okay, it'd be on like a reel to reel, and we would rent films from the Christian bookstore in Bellevue, and we and they would come in a big plastic thing, and they would load the reel to reel, and they'd go, you know, and we'd watch these films, and and one of the films um, that I remember watching uh, was called A Thief in the Night. Okay, and um, and we watched this this movie, and and uh, and Hetty, do you remember this? A thief in the night. These, you know, Travis was probably too young uh, for it. It's probably it's probably a good thing that you're too young to remember this. And uh, I remember um, uh, uh, watching this. It, it, the movie starts off. This is all from memory because I haven't seen it recently. Um, the movie starts off with a running razor, electric razor in the bathroom. And the character wakes up and goes into the bathroom to find the razor sitting by the sink and it's just running. And then she also hears a lawnmower and she looks outside the window, outside, and there's a lawnmower running with no one pushing it. Just sitting there, okay? And um, the funny thing is, is everybody knows that you can't just do that with a lawnmower, right? Like a lawnmower, you actually have to be holding the, the lever thing to keep it. But anyways, it's, it's Hollywood. So, the, <laughs> okay. And the point being is, okay, um, here's the main character and she's been left behind, okay? I wish we'd all been ready. Okay, freaky song by Larry Norman, okay? Some stuff happening in that movie, okay? She goes through this whole movie finding out that she's been left behind. The rapture has taken place, okay? Now there's one world order. There's the world police, and they are coming after her to get her to take, yep, the mark of the beast, which is basically when they take a typewriter to your head and input six, six, six. So they are chasing her with a typewriter the entire movie to put a 666 on her forehead. When we get to the very end of, of the movie, um, uh, her boyfriend is like, come on, babe, just get, you know, the end of the movie, uh, she it ends up on this massive water dam, this big dam, and she is, and, and she's cornered, and the, and, the, and the world, the One World Order helicopter is above her head, okay, and the One World, or like, basically, it's like the United Nations are coming out to her on, on the dam, and they're just like, just get the mark, and she's like, never, I won't get the mark, and her boyfriend's like, come on, babe, just get the mark, just get the mark, and she's like, I won't do it, and then finally, she goes to jump off the dam, the screen goes black, and you hear, she wakes up, thank God it was just a dream, she runs to the bathroom, and there's the electric razor running by the sink, she hears, she looks out the window to find, yep, the lawnmower, apparently the maintenance guy, okay, the landscaping guy was a Christian, and the person that shaves was a Christian, but... She had been left behind. Black screen again. 
That's the end. That's the end of the movie. Imagine being, you know, a kid, okay? You know, I was just like, oh, my God, right? Oh, what must I do to be saved, okay? You know, um, the sequel to that ended uh, with somebody, again, not going to get the mark, okay? And, and, and because of that, the guillotine is about to cut off their head. So the end of the sequel, okay? I want to say the sequels aren't as good. <laughs> not the case of that series, okay? Um, the sequel ends with a, with a blade about to cut their head off, okay? And all of a sudden, you, you just hear, <laughs> okay? And then ending titles, okay? Ending credits. Back when Christian movies were good, right? So anyways... <laughs> I was, ter- like, I was terrified. I remember, like, my mom says this, this, this day, like, honey, I'm so sorry for making you watch those movies. And yet I can hear that the, there's an argument in her voice because she's like, yeah, but you do love Jesus now, right? Like, you know, <laughs> hey, it could be worse. You could be in hell, <laughs> okay? But you're pastoring, and yes, the grace of God. It could be also the rapture movies, okay? So anyways, I was raised, okay? My dad, uh, every week, okay, we'd travel together. He had an awesome anointing on his ministry. Um, every week, you know, uh, he... Uh, he so believed, okay, that it was uh, his generation. He was born 1948, the year that Israel became a nation, that this was the nation that was going to see the rapture. Even growing up in school, wasn't a lot of emphasis even on my grades and such because we were part of a move of God, a revival that we believed was the final revival that was going to lead to an end-time harvest of souls, okay, and then the rapture, okay. All of a sudden, that move of God came to an end, okay, um, and my parents ended up, you know, getting a divorce and stuff. It was really sad. I ended up having to go to a new school, okay? And all of a sudden, I was like in the tribulation. I had to make new friends and all this. You know, I was like, I was supposed to be raptured out by now, okay? And actually, Jenny and I went to school. I, we met our junior year at Seattle Christian, okay, which is cool, and having to make all new friends and, every, and everything else. I remember um, I was going to go meet with the, the counselor, okay, and they were like, where do you want to go to school? We're going to get you ready to go into college. And I was like, I shouldn't be here. There's not supposed to be a college. There's supposed to be an end time harvest. Why am I here? I'm not here. This isn't happening. Singing Radiohead, okay, singing there. Um, and then all of a sudden, okay, they look at my transcripts. Like, Where are you going? I'm going, I, I'm going to go to NYU. I'm going to be a filmmaker. They look at my transcripts. They're like, you got rapture transcripts. <laughs> like, what? Like, you got the kind of transcripts from somebody that has not planned for the future. Okay, that was back in, you know, 99, okay. It's 2024, and my friends, we're still here. Okay, we're, 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 st- I'm still, okay. And, um, and so, that was my upbringing, okay? That was my upbringing um, in the church. And then I remember one day, um, I heard a, a pastor that I really respected. And he said, he, he said, at the end of the book, he goes, the church doesn't go up, but heaven comes down. And I thought, Heres, heretic. I thought, that's a heretic. I thought, what, what are we talking about? I had never read the end of the book, okay? I just thought at the end of the book, we go up and that's it, and God just destroys everything. Okay? And all of a sudden, I, and, and he, was a, he was a Presbyterian, and, and all of a sudden I, I realized there's a lot of different takes on the book of Revelation. So we've been studying the book of Revelation, and one of the things that we're learning is, is that the book of Revelation isn't just this, it's not a futuristic nightmare that God's going to try to rescue us from. The book of Revelation ties together all of the scriptures from Genesis all the way up to where we're living in the present. And it ties everything all together. The whole storyline of the scriptures. And all of a sudden you can see the great extent that God goes to, to not just redeem mankind, but literally to redeem and to restore even the cosmos itself. Okay? Humanity rebelled against God. Okay? Uh, the, the creation didn't. But everything was fractured because of mankind's fall. In the same way that everything has fallen because of the rebellion of mankind and because of the rebellion uh, uh, of Satan and his cronies, okay, um, the book of Revelation gives us, okay, this story of, of, of the Father and how he's going to give to his son as captured in Psalm 110. It says, and the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. Revelation tells us the story of how the father is going to give to his son the lamb, a kingdom without opposition. The restoration of all things. Uh, Paul talks about it, uh, the, the mystery of the will of God, okay? In Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10, it said, and he made known to us. He did to us? Yeah. He made known to us what? 
the mystery, the mystery of what? Of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he, purpo- which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect, to be catalyzed when the times reach their fulfillment. This is what Revelation captures, the time of fulfillment. Completion, to do what? To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. Interesting. In the late 1800s, there was a guy by the name of John Nelson Darby. Okay. John Darby was the founder of Exclusive Brethren, okay, the, uh, the, the Plymouth Brethren movement. Okay. And from John Darby came uh, the dispensational theology, okay, which this gave birth to the pre-tribulation rapture theology. Pre-tribulation rapture theology became the dominant theology for Christian ministry on radio and TV. So pretty much, if you were on radio and TV in the 80s and 90s, you were pre-trib rapture uh, theology. It was made famous, as I've said before, through the Schofield Bible that was rolled out in the early 1900s. Dispensationalism, what it does is it takes your entire Bible and it separates it up into seven different dispensations, seven different time periods, okay? The first one being the age of innocence, the moment that God created Adam and Eve to the moment of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. It's that place where when God said to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth, okay? What we call the great Edenic mandate, okay? Given to humanity. All right, with classic dispensationalism, they would say, okay, that was good, but that was for that time. And then when sin occurred, we entered into a new dispensation. The rules change, the character and nature of God and how he relates with humanity changes, so on and so forth. Until you get to the end times, you reach that final dispensation, when God fulfills his promise to Israel in that final dispensation. But it it affects the way that you read the Bible, okay? And I didn't even realize this, that in our study of Genesis, okay, I never took any of these things into consideration. I, I simply just said, you know, no, the way that we read the Bible, and this is what I believe, okay? And this is kind of how we teach the scriptures here at Eden without even, without even really trying to, without even, I don't think I've ever said from this platform, we teach victorious kingdom theology here at Eden. I don't think I've ever said that, but we do. Okay, so now I've said it, all right, okay? <laughs> and, and what does that mean? That means that we believe that the storyline of the Bible is this, that God is a father, that he is a good father from the beginning of the book all the way to the end of the book. Even as we read today in Revelation chapter 8, okay, and we're going to read about the sounding of the trumpets, okay, heaven going to war, okay, we read these texts, okay, with great joy in our heart. Why? Because we believe that God is a good father that since the beginning all he has ever wanted was a home. Okay, that heaven and earth would be together, that the prayer of Jesus would be satisfied on earth as it is in heaven, that all he has ever wanted from the very beginning is a family. Okay, and all of a sudden, when you begin to read the Bible through the lenses of, of, of the family of God, you begin to hear things, even within other traditions within Christianity, and it kind of grieves you, uh, pertaining to the character and nature of God, or pertaining to things that are trying to be projected onto God's people, and, and, and relating to like their depravity and, and, and being evil and whatnot. All of a sudden, you realize that even when people are, don't know Jesus, because, because you read the Bible through the lenses of God being a father, there's a part of your heart that is breaking. Why? Because you see, you see these outsiders as brothers and sisters that haven't been awakened to the great sacrifice, the lamb that was slain for their forgiveness. Okay? And for that reason, when we were at City Hall, there was a man with a big picket board, right, that, that he was wearing, it, and, it, and it said, you know, turn or burn, beep, you know, <laughs> you know turn or burn, okay? And, and, he, and it was just like, you know, and you've seen the guys at the Mariner Games with the blowhorns and stuff, you know, they believe in Jesus, okay? They read their Bibles, okay? They know their Bibles quite, quite well. And then you hear the people at Eden, they're up there at the microphone, and they're not condemning people. Like you have Pastor Patty up there, and she's just like, I love each and every one of you. 
I just wish you knew the heart of God. Why? Because we read the Bible differently and we see God as a good father who doesn't take off his hat of love in order to put on a hat of punishment. We see that God in his love does judgment, which is justice. Why? Because it is his desire to see all things restored and reconciled. Isn't that awesome? So don't take for granted what we, what we, what we have here, even, even, even at, at, at Eden and how we read, and how we read um, the Bible. All right, let me catch you up. Revelation chapter 5, we're in the throne room, okay? And we get to see the revealing, the disclosing of the Lamb, okay? The enthronement of the Lamb. This is the inauguration of the kingdom. The Lamb is being enthroned, okay? The kingdom age is beginning. You and I are a part of the victorious age of the kingdom that is growing little by little, day by day, glory to glory. So when you got these people on YouTube saying, it's, it's bad, it's gonna get worse, it's gonna get worse, it's gonna get worse, be afraid, be very, very afraid. Have bunkers, have ammunition, have top ramen, have, you know, it's just going on. It's gonna get worse, okay? You see it, it's bad, it's worse, get out of the cities, okay? Get away from sinners, okay? Just get away, move to Texas, okay? That we all should move to Texas, okay? And no offense to, 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 the, to the 20 of you that are, okay? Okay, awesome. Troy Brewer's waiting for you. I, I'm, I'm about to go to Texas to lead an exodus here to Seattle. Anyways, um, okay, uh, so hallelujah, okay. Um, so Jesus said the kingdom of God is like the man that finds a treasure in the field, okay, and then buries it back in the field and then joyfully sells everything that he has so that he can go back and buy that field, okay. The kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed. It seems little, but baby, you plant it and it begins to grow. This, guys, this is not the time to freak out. This is not the time to panic, okay. This is the time to buy homes. This is the time to plant vineyards. This is the time to have families, to have children, to be stinking fruitful and multiply. Why? The narrative hasn't changed. His plan hasn't changed. His plan in Genesis 1 and 2 hasn't changed. You and I are the righteous, the, the sadek. You and I the, are, were called from the beginning to be a company of priests, okay? To steward and sustain to the glory of God from city to city and from nation to nation. This is how, this is how we read and engage. okay, all of a sudden, here he is. Okay, the kingdom age has begun because of the lamb who is slain and is enthroned. This is Revelation chapter five. It is awesome, okay? And then John sees a scroll and there was nobody worthy to open the scroll, okay? And he begins to weep and he's like, there's nobody worthy, okay? And, 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 and on heaven and earth, okay? He's just like, ah, okay. And all of a sudden he, okay? And then all of a sudden the proclamation, the lion is trying to turn to see the lion, he sees the lamb, the lamb reaches out, okay, grabs the scroll. Okay, what is the scroll? Okay, this is the Lamb's scroll. It's a classified document. It's sealed shut. Seven seals. The seals are not the content itself. The seals are not the data. The seals, the wax seal of the king to keep it shut. Only this is the Lamb's Book. This is the story of the gospel of the kingdom. This is, this is, the, this is the prophetic case. And you say, no, this is the scroll of judgment. Yes, you are right. Why? Because with the breaking of the seven seals, with the opening of the scroll, okay, uh, 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 the gospel is about to be released and it is going to subvert every principality, every power, every cosmic injustice, everything that has kept humanity from the fullness and awareness of the glory of God that covers the waters, that keeps people from the love of God. And so, yes, there is going to be wrath poured out, okay? This, uh, but this isn't punishment in and of itself. It's the judgment of God, which is the justice of God, and it's the justice of God that makes things right, with the breaking of the seals, there's going to be some things that happen that look harsh, but it's because there are earthly realities with heavenly corresponding powers, and these institutions are going to be brought low. 
Okay, and this is what is uh, happening here. The, the breaking, uh, okay, Revelation chapter 6, with the breaking of these seals, we see the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And they are summoned into the throne room, okay? We have the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. With the breaking of the fifth seal, okay, we, are, we get to see the revelation of the cry of the martyrs, the blood of the martyrs, okay? Those who have been slain uh, because of their proclamation of coming Messiah. And they say, is now our time. Upon the enthronement of the Lamb, perhaps now is the time for justice in our vindication okay and they are told now is not yet the time but here is your white robes okay there will be justice blood has a voice in the word of God life is in the blood and here are those who have been martyred for their declaration and the blood of the innocent is crying out for vindication and the promise is as that is there will be justice you will be vindicated and you will ascend and you will be seated here in the throne room okay um Revel uh, we see the sixth seal. We got into this. And with the sixth seal, it's day of the Lord terminology, okay? It's a great earthquake. It's the, the day turning to, to night. Um, the moon turns to blood. Then last week, we got into Revelation 7, okay? And we see the 144,000. And we see the detailed accounting of the Jewish Tribes. You say, why are they being counted this way? Because this is the way that both Moses and David would count an army. Okay, there is an end times army that is being put together composed of the Jewish tribes, 144,000. And when John turns to see the 144, it's just like when John hears, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. John turns to see the lion. Okay? But when he turns to see the lion, he sees a lamb. A baby lamb. Baby, baby slain lamb. Right? Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Lion. No, it's a lamb. Okay, same thing happens here. Behold, 144,000 end time army. He turns to see the 144,000. And what does he see? He sees representation of every tribe, every nation. He sees an innumerable army, end time army. Okay? And this is a big deal. Why? Because what the Lord is bringing together in the throne room, nothing has happened on the earth yet. What the Lord is doing is he is getting ready for a holy war. The Lord is about to wage war on the devil and his cronies, okay? And here we see in the throne room, we see the four horsemen. <laughs> Okay, we hear the cry of the martyrs. Oh, vindication. Okay, and here's the army. Here's the representation of Israel. Okay, turn to see Israel. See every nation. Okay, and this, and this, you know, and, and here we see, and this is where some people say, you know, we read, we read the Bible only from the perspective of Israel. Okay, it's all, this is about the Israel army. And then other people say, no, 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 it's not about that. It's all about, okay, it's all about um, the Gentiles, okay, and this whole, and every nation. No, no, what is it? It is both and it is Israel, it is every nation coming together to form one family, one new man. What is this? This is like this massive escalation in, in the heavenly realm, this massive buildup, this massive uh, crescendo that is building, that brings us to, uh, to today. Are you guys ready? This is so awesome. This is, this is the call to war, Revelation uh, chapter 8. Now, we're about to see three judgments that actually begin to take place on the earth. Revelation 7 through 11 are going to be judge, judgments against Jerusalem and the Jewish system. Okay? Um, uh, this is not the end of the Jewish people. This is not the end of their prophetic purpose on the earth. But this is the bringing to an end what some scholars would refer to as the Old Covenant era. Okay? Ju uh, Revelation 12 to 14, we see divine judgment come upon the Roman system, the Roman government, the evil empire of Rome. 
from Revelation 15 to 18, we see the judgment of God brought against every principality and power, every cosmic puppet master that was behind Okay, the, the corruption within the Israel government, the corruption within the Roman government, the corruption between in the Babylonian government, the corruption in the American government. Why? Because the same principalities and powers that were the puppet masters behind Babylon are at work today. So what we're actually going to see is literal judgments that take place on the earth Okay, that were prophesied to the early church where they saw fulfillment of these judgments. First one being which was, as I am teaching, okay, through my understanding, the seven-year tribulation as to how it was poured out from Revelation 7 to 11 with Jerusalem here. And then we go into Rome. Here we go. Revelation 8, when the Lamb, there he is, opened the seventh seal Look at this. There was silence in the heavens for half an hour, 30 minutes. Then I saw seven angels who stand before God. Seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And when he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints, rose before God from the hand of the angel. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightnings, and an earthquake. Verse 6. Now the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all of the grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel blew his trumpet. And a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died and the water because it had been made bitter. Verse 12. The fourth angel blew his trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck. And a third of the moon. And a third of the stars. So that a third of their light might be darkened. And a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Here's the eagle. What's the eagle doing? The eagle's talking. Of course the eagle's talking. It's revelation, and eagles talk in revelation. What's he saying? Whoa, 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 right? to those who dwell on the earth and at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Okay, I'm going to move quickly here, but I'm going to take you back to Matthew and a prophetic word that Jesus gave to the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay, Matthew 23, verse 34 to 36. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city on that you may come to all the righteous bloodshed on the earth from the, righteous, uh, um, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah from the son of, Becher, of, of Berechiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. This is what Jesus is saying to the scribes of his generation. The blood of the martyrs within all of your uh, genealogies up to the present, those that prophesied the coming of Messiah, Yeshua, assuredly I say to you, all these things, this judgment will come upon, not a generation, a thousand years from now, he says, will come 
upon this generation. Okay, the generation that heard Jesus say these words is going to be the generation that sees the great and devastating Jewish war. Okay, during this time, we see Jerusalem surrounded by 20,000 Roman soldiers. There's starvation, cannibalism, even the destruction of the temple itself. Massive slaughter. It's interesting because when an early church uh, father, Isabus of Caesarea, um, he writes in his, in his works about what took place here. And he says that the early Christians fled because of prophetic revelation about the impending Roman siege that they fled to a region called Pella, and there they were able to escape the catastrophic events that took place. Here is a seven-year literal tribulation that the Jewish people are going to go through, and Josephus, in his writing, never once states the execution of any believers within the Jewish war. Okay? Jesus in Matthew 24 even says, when you hear of, the, of, of what is to come, flee to the mountains. Okay? And so what we see here is that the early church okay, got out of the area before this time, which is, which is amazing. So when we're looking at Revelation 8, um, we see um, the seventh seal that is about to be broken. Okay? And when it is, silence fills heaven. Silence for 30 minutes. Now, I think that's cool. I mean, isn't that fun that John knew how long time is going? You know, are there clocks in heaven, right? Was he able to read the sun up there? I, you know, I, I'm not sure. But for 30 minutes, it's silent. Here's what I know about silence. When you're in silence, quiet things become really loud. You know, I was just up in Canada, okay, bear hunting. I told you about that, but I just like to say bear hunting and then just kind of like stand in that, okay? And this is what they say about, uh, about bear hunting. They say, just before you see a bear, the woods go silent, okay? When I was up there in that tree, it was, it was starting to get dark. There was rain. There was wind. That forest was loud, okay? There were birds out there making noises. I didn't know birds could make there's birds out there that actually sound like generators. They're, you know, anyway, like, you know, it, the forest is loud, okay? Just before that bear came out, it stopped raining. The wind stopped. All the birds stopped. That forest went quiet. It was totally quiet. It was so weird. And I'll tell you what, when that stick broke behind me, it was the loudest stick break I've ever heard in my life. Okay, that forest was quiet. I remember just paying attention to the, I, I didn't hear any bears. I just knew this forest is quiet. This is weird, okay? If I didn't have a gun, that, this would be bad, okay? And then all of a sudden I heard it breathe, <laughs> okay? The beast. All right, we'll be getting into that later on. In, the, <laughs> in, in Okay, what's happening here? You know, scholars have a lot of different ideas in what happens here with the breaking of the seventh seal, okay? But here's, this, here's one interpretation I think is pretty cool. Okay, the heavens, okay, it's, it's the horses, okay, it's, it's holies, it's angel cries, okay, it's the cry of the martyrs, vindicate us, it's justice, okay, it's heaven is like the loud, how many know that a womb is loud, okay, and, and, and you know, yes, I remember, okay, but anyway, like, like heaven is like a womb that is ecstatic with a roar, and all of a sudden, upon the breaking of the seventh seal, heaven goes quiet. And some scholars say that heaven goes quiet so that the incense and the prayers of the saints can be heard. Because immediately following, it says that heaven goes quiet for 30 minutes, and then it begins to talk about the prayers of the saints that begin to fill the throne room like an, like an incense. Think about this as well. This is an escalation, okay? Uh, the heavens are preparing for war, okay? Yahweh is summoning his horsemen, okay? All, we're in the midst of a roar, okay? And all of a sudden, everything goes silent upon this great crescendo. Why? Because there is about to be the proclamation of a trumpet. 
Okay, um, in, in ancient times, when it was time to go to war, okay, the trumpet blast was the declaration that the war has begun. Okay, it is like this final moment of the fear of God, of the awe of God, and knowing that the judgment of God is a, that the justice of God. Okay, that the process of making things right in the unseen realms and the seen realms is about to take place. This is about to begin. It goes quiet. 30 minutes. And then, look at this, from the seventh seal comes the trumpets. Okay? And then from the trumpets is going to come the bulls. Okay? So we got a seals, okay, where a quarter of everything is affected. Okay? And then we get into um, uh, 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 the, the trumpets where a third of everything is going to be affected. And then from the last trumpet comes forth the bulls. Okay? Some theologians have, have likened this to like one of those Russian dolls where you open up a doll and then there's another doll and then there's another doll. It's, it's as if there's one judgment captured from three different perspective. It's the seals. We come in closer, okay? And then it's the trumpets. It's, it's, the, it's the engagement. And then we come in closer and we see, um, we see the bulls. Verse 7, and the first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed. Okay, um, when the ancients would go to war, there would be the declaration of the trumpets and then the archers would release their arrows, their burning arrows. It's almost like there's a a parallel here. Silence, the trumpet blast, and the firing of the arrows. And mixed, okay, the, the followed with hail, fire, mixed with blood. These are thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees burned up, okay, and all the grass was burned up, okay. Um, what is this? We see, okay, uh, vegetation being struck. I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking trees being burned, okay, all right, and, and I like trees, okay, okay. I'm, I don't exactly hug them, okay. I don't exactly cry when they get cut down, but just a very interesting, why, why is there this vivid accounting of grass being burned? Just kind of interesting when you're, when, you're, when you're reading this. Also, most of us, when we view the earth, okay, this is the, how many of you have wrestled with this? When you read Revelation, you, you read the earth, and immediately you see the earth as, the earth through the discovery channel, the spinning blue planet out in the middle of the cosmos. Okay? Um, yeah, so a lot of us, when we're reading these prophetic words about, uh, you know, the, the earth, okay, we see the entire earth, okay? Um, the, the early church didn't read the text this way, okay? They didn't, they didn't know better. They didn't know how to follow the science yet. They, they didn't know that it was a, a spinning rock, okay? All they knew was the earth as the biblical model, flat earth. Okay, let's keep reading. And I'm just having fun I'm trying to keep you awake for the next five minutes. Here we go. When we see here earth, we see the Greek word, it's spelled G-E, like General Electric. So the word for the earth, the reason why we wrestle with a lot of the prophetic words here is because we're like this hasn't happened to the earth, right? When we're reading this, we're like this hasn't happened on the earth. But when they read this, they, they would read the word in Greek, G-E, okay, which is earth as in dirt, as in ground, but most commonly used land, okay, when a third of the land. Now, if you, look, if you apply this idea, okay, so maybe it is the whole earth, but the early church, when they read this, they viewed this as the land given to God's people, the Israelites. This, this ties right into um, the writings given. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures. You don't have to write them down. It's all being recorded. It's Numbers 32, 17. Numbers 33, 52 and 55. It's Joshua chapter 7, verse 9. It's Joshua 9, 24. It's Judges 1, 32. It's 2 Samuel uh, chap uh, chapter 5, verse 6. It's 1 Chronicles 11, verse 4. 1 Chronicles 22, 18. It's Nehemiah 9, 24. This is the land given to God's 
people in context of exile, the Jewish people being exiled from their land, from uh, it, Jeremiah 1.14, Jeremiah 10.18, Ezekiel 7.7. 7. This is the land given to God's people, okay, uh, and, uh, whether you're being brought into it or being exiled from it. And that same word, G E or land. So when the early church would read this text, they weren't looking at this nightmare being instigated by, by in, 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 in the throne room unfolding on the earth as a futuristic nightmare where we would have to figure out, okay, is God going to rapture us out before it begins? Or is God going to rapture us out in the middle of this time? Or is God going to rapture us out at the end of this time? And for me, those were the only three options I was ever given. I had people join the church and they're like, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? I thought those were the only three options. But all of a sudden you're reading guys like John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon and, and guys that were alive in the second century and third century and fourth century. And I'm like, for a thousand years, this was the theology of the church? And it wasn't until the early 1900s. Guys, that's when Mormonism was found. Now, I realize that we're all in different places, and I realize, I've said this to you guys before, I'm not a professional at Revelation. I'm a student of the book, okay? So in no way, you know, do I want to steal the rapture from you, okay? Um, if you're looking to get out of here, sweet, cool. I don't want to steal that from you. Either way, we all believe that Jesus is coming, amen? And with him, the new Jerusalem, rule and reign uh, with King Jesus. But when you begin to look um, at this text, we see that vegetation is struck through this judgment. It's interesting because during this literal war, it was a seven-year war, Rome came in on Jerusalem, and what did they do? They lit fires all around Jerusalem. And guess what happened? They burned the trees, and they burned, yep, you guessed it, the grass. According to Josephus, they cut down and burned 93 furlongs of forest and grass going all the way around Jerusalem to create a shock and awe strategy against God's people. Did you know that when Rome came in and invaded Jerusalem, they changed the name of Jerusalem to Palestine? Do you know that this word Palestine, it is the word Philistine? That they, that they put together to create Palestine in order to be a slap in the face to the Jewish people. Okay, so this is what they came in. It was a strategy to stress God's people out, to stress out the, the Israelites before they actually came in um, with, with this war. The second trumpet was an attack against the seas. The sea turns to blood. We also see the, with the third trumpet, all the surrounding waters are struck bitter. It talks about wormwood. Or it can also be translated as, 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 as uh, uh, gall, okay? Bitterness. You couldn't drink of the waters. That when, did you know that when Rome came in during this war, they, they, they killed so many thousands of Jews in the Sea of Galilee that Josephus says that the Sea of Galilee was turned to blood as corpses lined all of the shores going around the sea. Uh, uh, they said that the, the water was so polluted that it put a bitterness even into the Jordan River. So here you have Jesus talking to the scribes in his time, saying this judgment, the judgment of the generations, it's about to be unfolded and experienced in this generation. We come into Revelation, the breaking of these seals, the sounding of these trumpets, and we see a very um, uh, literal word, but it's full of symbolism. And this is where you're going to have to go and do your own research because it's full of symbolism. Numbers and, and symbols tying through places all throughout the scriptures I, where I just felt like, man, I'm already in danger of losing you, okay, let alone a PowerPoint deck of 300 slides giving you every cross-reference. But if you have a good study Bible, many of you have study Bibles through here, 
You should just get a, a, a good study Bible, and it will give to you. I don't, I don't care. It could be NIV, ESV. It doesn't matter. Any good stu- study Bible will give you all of the cross references, and you can just begin to read the text and see where, where in Isaiah is this linked to? Where in Ezekiel is this linked to? Many scholars say that the book of Revelation is the most biblical of all the books of the Bible because there are more cross references in the book of Revelation than any other book of the Bible. And what are they doing? They're revealing the Lamb. They're revealing the Christ. They're revealing the story, the good news of the gospel of his kingdom as he comes to redeem and restore everything. Okay, the fourth trumpet, the heavens are struck, right? We see imagery of the sun, the moon, and the stars, okay? A third of them falling. I heard one minister, a very respected minister within our, within our stream. He does a lot of teaching on Revelation. Okay, and I've been trying to just listen. Man, I've got like... They're digital books, thank God, because I don't think a library, you know, just got books and stuff, okay? Watching videos. I'm trying to watch as many different perspectives as possible, but one of them I was reading, listening to, this guy this last week, if I told you his name, you all would know, but he says, when you read Revelation, you read it literally. You just read it literally, right? Like if it says it, just take a literal. Okay, the problem with that is that if you've got literal stars, falling out of the sky onto the earth, okay? How many of them is it going to take to just kill everything, everybody? And not only that, but the earth is so small in comparison to any star that if any star were to fall on the earth, it wouldn't fall on the earth. It would vacuum us into it. That when you're reading the scriptures about the sun, the moon, and the stars, what we see here, these are symbols pointing to leaders, And here is a land where a third of its leadership is going to be removed. All right. So here we have hail, blood, waters going bitter, darkness, uh, locusts. We're going to read of the four horsemen. All of this taking place here. And what do we have? We have this parallel with what took place in Egypt. It's like these plagues are being released on the earth again. And who are these plagues being released from? A good father who has not taken off his hat of love in order to put on his hat of punishment. No, the father in his love is going to redeem and restore all of creation into himself. These seals are going to be broken. The scroll is going to be unrolled. Through one man, sin entered the world. Through one man, okay, humanity, okay, we rebelled against God, but all of the creations didn't rebel. Creation, it fell because of our decision. But the true and perfect Adam, the second Adam, through one man, righteousness, redemption, and restoration, excuse me, and restoration could occur. Through Jesus the Christ and revelation is the apocalyptic literature. It's the vision that gives us the storyline and sequence of the God who in his love wages war against every demonic foe that has cost nations its salvation, that has cost humanity from from being embraced by the Father. This is the epic big complicated, complex book of the Bible that we will just do our best to kind of keep moving through. Bottom line, at the end of the day, this is the revelation of Jesus, the Christ, the holy and anointed one who on the cross did it stink in all so that you do not have to try to save yourself. This is not a self-help movement, okay? This is a movement of the Lamb. This is a movement of Yeshua and His kingdom. The Bible says, okay, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That means that without submission unto the Lamb, your trajectory is not good. Okay? It means that your system is a system of decay and death. But if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is his Lord, he'll be faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and to righteously judge the power of sin that has been unaccountable within your family line. His blood will bring it into an account. 
His blood will sever those ties that put that pressure on you to be silly, just like great grandpappy was silly. Jesus says, enough of the silliness. You surrender your life to me, I'll give you my Holy Spirit. Okay? A demonic spirit will make you evil, but his Holy Spirit will make you holy. You'll receive the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control okay well what it is is it's just it's just that place of realizing you can't save yourself you can't fix yourself your faith doesn't even save you it's his grace given to you by faith in Christ we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone hallelujah this is the good news of the kingdom of God that you're being invited into and it means that you got to be willing to wave the white flag on your own earthly kingdom, on your own earthly agenda, your own religious agendas, your own self-righteous agendas, even your own prophetic agendas. Hallelujah. We raise the flag. We say, I'm tapping out of my self-righteous efforts to be a better person. And I'm saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. I surrender myself to you. You guys have been awesome. You guys have been so patient. Listen, I get it. That was not, this was not a, this wasn't cookies and juice today. This wasn't a Sunday school message. There was a lot here. It is online. I invite you to search out the scriptures. You are absolutely loved. Let's stand to our feet. I want to bless you. Um, as we wrap this up, our ministry team is going to come. So you don't have to leave. If you need prayer for anything today, we just invite you to come up here, receive prayer. We'll stand with you, pray for you, prophesy over you. Make sure that you leave this place better than the way that you came. Go ahead and lift up your hands in this house. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your grace, your divine enablement on each and every person here. Father, I thank you that even as we declare during worship, the wait is over. We detach ourselves from the spirit of grief and the expectation of calamity. We detach ourselves even from the lust for tribulation and we say yes to receiving of the grace of God, the fine drink of his new wine. And we thank you, Lord, that we are sons and daughters of the most high God. We no longer have to tolerate uh, the, the spirit of Pharaoh, Goliath, slavery, manipulation within our life. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And our expectation is life, freedom, joy, empowerment by the Spirit of God. And all the people of God said, Amen, amen and amen. I call you blessed this morning. You are loved.